All right, hello everyone, um, alumni, students, friends of the school in Siad. I'm Peter Zemsky, strategy professor and deputy dean, um, coming to you live from Fontainebleau. Um, with the last of our tech talks for this academic year, it's been a, a great lineup, but we still end on a bang with really the great topic of fintechs and with a great speaker in the CEO of Finastra. Um, for those of those, you who might be missing us over the summer, I encourage you to go to digital.nci.edu, click on the events tab, and you will find lots of recordings of not only our earlier tech talks, but also our popular In the Case series, and you can uh, catch up on what you missed over the summer. And welcome back to INSEAD, Simon. So Simon um, joined Finestra, um, formerly I miss this, we'll, we'll talk about the history a little bit. Um, back in president in 2015, deputy CEO in 2017, and then been CEO of the group since 2018. And I think the key thing we're going to hear about is under his leadership, they really launched this flagship open banking platform where they're really a portal supporting, you know, everything to accelerate collaboration across um, financial services from retail, banking, payments, lending, corporate banking, treasury, capital markets. Um, so really today, if you don't know them, Finestra is one of the largest fintech companies in the world, 1.8 billion of revenue, 8,000 employees. I think the key thing is 9,000 customers, including 90 of the top 100 banks across 130 um, countries. So really, Simon's got a front row seat on a very active and also very complicated sector. Um, many awards, um, 21 this last year, nominated number two on the top 50 financial technology CEO list. Um, you know, how do you get a job like that? Some of the students may be asking. So before that, he was a senior associate at McKinsey and interestingly, president of Industry Cloud at SAP. Um, involved, um, obviously serves on different boards, um, Everbridge, Thomson Reuters, uh, but also worth highlighting for today's talk, he chairs the World Trade Board, something um, initiated by Finestra, really pulling together a lot of luminaries and, and thought leaders in, um, in all you know, trade, finance, commerce, really trying to shape um, the future of global trade, inclusion, and prosperity. And last but not least, um, Simon graduated from INSEAD in 1998, June. Um, and as a good INSEADer, he's actually been quite active as a leader in diversity, inclusion, and gender equality. Okay, Simon, so now, now we've set expectations high. Really, welcome back to INSEAD. Thank you, Peter. It's good to be here and it's good to see you. All right, very good. Um, so again, what we're going to do is obviously explore your views, first of all, on financial services, and then take a little time for the, the trade work that you do, and, and then um, your insights as a leader around diversity and stuff. All right, first of all, to get so the audience gets to know you, what do you do? What is it? What does your week look like as, as CEO of um, Finestra? And maybe also take a little time for those not familiar with the group to talk a little bit about your activities and your strategy. Yeah, by all means. So on question one, what do I do in a typical week? I would say it roughly breaks down a third, a third, a third. So a third of the time, very much towards facing the market and listening to the voice of the customer, the voice of the partners, the voice of the analysts, the voice of the competitors and really understanding the dynamics and the geographies and dynamics and the tiers that we serve is at least a third of the time. The other third of the time is really around the internal stakeholder, around the employee base and uh, their constituents and their representations about how they see we're evolving and the speed at which we're evolving uh, towards our future. And then the other third, uh, the joy of private equity, there's a lot of stakeholders, lenders and investors who need to be uh, informed and that's probably another third of the time, the royal they. So that's uh, about how a typical week looks. Uh, in terms of what we do and why we do it, um, if you're okay, I'll just flash up a, a few slides very quickly. I won't drain them or be boring. So if you said, what's the big idea? You see it here on the screen. The big idea behind Finastra is this idea that the future of finance is open. And in fact, you can see we've used the brackets, which any developer would recognize, meaning we are open by default. If you look across the bottom, what does that mean? It means open standards, open source, open architecture, open APIs, open, 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 however you mean it. Now, three years ago, when we declared this as our, our bold idea, a lot of people thought we were crazy. Looking back three years later, it's clearly evident that the future of finance is open. If we click onto the next slide and say, okay, bring it down a level, 
we've already declared that the vision is the future of finance is open. The mission, however, we want to execute that vision by becoming the number one open platform for innovation and financial services. Now, those are nice words. What do they mean? That means when you look in the mirror of honesty or the mirror of introspection, 95% of all innovation does not come from us. So what do I do as a CEO? Do I sweat the team to make it 94%, 93%? Or do I inverse the question and say, hey, how about we think about the problem differently? How about we capture, inculcate, motivate, monetize, enable the world's innovators through a platform-based approach? And that's what Peter was referring to at the beginning. Now to purpose, you know, we, we sincerely believe that attracting, retaining, and motivating great talent is a purpose-driven topic, ever more so. So our purpose is to unlock potential. As simple as that, unlock potential of people, businesses, and communities everywhere. That's kind of what we do. How we do it on the next slide, and then we can take them down. We are a software company. and We say software three times. Software, 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 because we have three different commercial and business models. On the left-hand side, and we draw them as a Venn diagram because they interconnect, they're intertwined, they're, they're mutually dependent, but also mutually reinforcing. Software applications resolve problems within a business. So Peter mentioned, if you want to process service or distribute a loan, you might consider one of our software applications. Marketplaces resolve problems between businesses. So for example, in Canada, there are 17,000 mortgage brokers. There are 60 banks with multiple mortgages. They broker those mortgages on our marketplace. And then the platform is to ignite the world's innovators to create, deploy, and monetize their applications. So that's what we do. We're a global company headquartered out of London, as Peter said. That's great. Um, what do you, uh, just as we warm up, tell us a little, what do you love about your job? And also, what do you think you're, you're bringing to this role from, from your experience and your, just the, the nature of you as a leader? Yeah, so in terms of what I love about the job, and my love genuinely about technology is there is no destination. You never arrive. It's always moving. And it's always being enabled to something new that you haven't necessarily thought of. So every day is change. So I like that. It's, it's about the journey. What I also like is the speed. If you don't move, you're someone behind you, you, you mentioned I'm in the front row seat, Peter. In the second row are people who want to be in the front row. So you better keep, you better keep moving because they want to be doing what you're doing or to take you out of the equation. So it's innovate or die a little bit. And that's an exciting place to be. You know, I always tell my team that um, if you join the Navy, expect to see the sea. Now, sometimes the sea is nice and flat and sometimes it's pretty intimidating, but it is the nature of the technology industry. I think what I, what I bring, and a lot of this is credit to INSEAD and the education I received at INSEAD all those years ago, is you know everyone has a style of leadership, everyone has a style of approach, and if you can bring your best self, if you can be your authentic self, it's how you're gonna succeed uh, and get pleasure at the same time. So I think that's something that uh, I found here at Financial, the ability to just be myself. Great, anyway, I, I, um, from having, I guess, had you as a, as a student when I was a young professor, um, I, I think I, I now look forward to learning from you. It's only, only fair. Um, okay, so quickly, um, two things as we, as we dig into financial services. One, um, you know, there's this old Bill Gates quote, um, the world needs banking, but it doesn't need banks. And, and I, I know that's something I've heard you, you say. So we'd love to hear you elaborate on that. And then the second thing to set this up, just when I, on the one hand, financial services, as you said, it's incredibly fast moving today. Um, you know, the stakes are high, so there's huge motivation. Also, it's an information business. So it, in some ways it lends itself naturally to digitalization. But at the same time, it's not so simple. There's a lot of regulation, a lot of complexity, which means it really is a, a, a vibrant ecosystem with different species, different types of players coexisting. So I think it's quite hard for, for those outside or on the edges to really follow what's going on. So um, help us, how do you make sense of where we are today and where you think we're heading? Yeah, so, so starting where you started with Bill Gates' quote, that the world needs banking, it does not necessarily need banks. And as you said, it's an information business that doesn't yet realize it is an information business. It still thinks it's a product business. So if, for example, I'm on a customer journey to buy a house, then my bank will propose its mortgage product. It won't matter if that's the right product for me, right? Whereas if it were an information business, they would say, hey, Simon, knowing what we know about you, here's how we need to help you find your house, finance your house, you know, go through the title and deeds, insure your house, move in, optimize utility bills. They would build uh, a journey around me as opposed to push products at me. And I think that's the big change that's upon us. Financial services is getting back to the financial service, focusing on the customer at the center. 
Now that's a big change. You remember the famous interview that Jeff Bezos had on 60 Minutes when they accused him of selling books. And he said, you know, I don't sell books. I sell which book you should read, right? Now mm -hmm. in financial services to say, hey, Peter, Simon, I know enough about your life that these are the things that you should be thinking about. And the services that I, I assemble to your persona, to your customer journey for the value prop that you're trying to get are these ones. They don't necessarily come from me. That is banking as opposed to product. And just make the connection to um, banking is open. How does that interact with this, this vision? Yeah, so if you make the connection to banking is open, there was the CEO of ING, Ralph Homers, who's now the CEO of UBS. He was one of the first CEOs I met in banking who used the words manufacturing and distribution, right? So he said, hey, why if I manufacture one of the world's best mortgage products, would I limit myself to sell it only through my channel? Why wouldn't I sell it through any channel? Likewise, if somebody has a better product than mine, why would I withhold them from not being able to distribute it through my channel? So he was the one, of the one of the first people who started to think about the service and compiling what mattered most, what was best for the customer journey. Now, back to your question of open, to do that, you need an open mindset. You need to be able to say, well, I'm sorry, this is not the best product for the customer. It's not what they need. You know, I've been banking with the same bank for 40 years and I still get a note saying, hey, Simon, you've been pre-approved for an overdraft. It's not what I need. <laughs> you know, what, what, and you know everything about- That's good to hear, Simon. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Um, and, and so now to work, just to start working all these elements in, what does this dynamic mean for these different types of players, right? So what does it mean, obviously, for the legacy banks, the incumbents, and, and, and how, are they, how do they need to adapt and what would their role be in the ecosystem versus all these, these waves and waves of fintechs are coming, plus the big tech players, and, and again, infrastructure players like yourself? Yeah. No, there's a great phrase that somebody used, used with me, which was uh, the following. Will the incumbents get innovation before the innovators get distribution? Mm. Yeah, and that's, that's a really interesting question. Now, in some areas like payments, you could argue that it's already too late, right? If you think about the, you know, if you look at the market capitalization of the world's most valuable financial institutions in 2010 and compare them to 2020, they are completely different. In 2020, it's Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, Stripe, it's... They're not banks. Yeah, and what? And, and so what? Um, what's behind that? So if we unpack that, what? What has? What's driven payments so so far up in the space and, and allowed also? Not, it's both the innovation, but also the value capture there. How, how are these companies doing so well? Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a combination of the, a few a few factors. The first is the technology threshold has reduced. So the ability to send the wire money from Spain to the Philippines has reduced. So the idea of sending $100 back home as a remittance, but being charged $25 to do so, it, you know, that is no longer viable economics and it can be brought down where people can make the transaction for less than $1, right? So technology has broken the threshold of which or the barrier to entry for, for the market. The second is cultural, which is people are saying, hey, the service is payment. Why do I need a bank? It's banking as a service. I need payment as a service or foreign exchange as a service or cash management as a service. So they're bypassing the banking network. Now, to your point, they still need to do that under a regulatory um umbrella and they do comply, but it's extraordinary how fast that has moved. Uh, actually, one thing just to, to flag for people who don't know, uh, one of the big IPOs in Europe is gonna be TransferWise, although they started with transfers now, they're now going to the market as just wise. And that was uh, founded, co-founded by an INSEAD alum. Um, I guess that, that illustrates well kind of what you're talking about. And yes, I am a very happy wise customer. So when I have to pay for my, my, my kids going to college, I do it through wise. Yeah, yeah. I would have to say me too, but that's, a, that's another conversation perhaps. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, yeah, we won't get into the overdraft situation. Um, so uh, what, um, and, and Finestra, so let's, let's go back to your strategy. So how, where, where are the biggest opportunities for you in, in this, this, this evolving space? Yeah, so something, Peter, you taught, taught us a long time ago is eventually you do have to stick to the knitting, right? Quoting Michael Porter. So we've decided that sticking to the knitting in our case is to do what we do well which is highly complex, very difficult, mission critical business processes and workflows, which people often talk about as the back office. So that can be complex lending, it can be you know, high value or instant payments, it can be complex treasury and capital markets. That's what we do. But because that's not enough, we've had to change the way we think and open all of those up to say, hey, 
all of you who are trying to get to the golden source of truth, the golden source of truth that everyone's trying to get to is the customer contract. And the proxy for the contract is that which resides in the application. So everyone's trying to get to the application to be able to work with the, with the truth, the contract. So that's what we've decided to do. Stick to what we do well, core applications, expose them out through a platform and enable marketplaces. And in terms of your customer base, how do you assure that you're both serving legacy plus, you know, the new, new up and coming players? How, how does that play out for you? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we're all of an age group where we know what we know, but the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns sometimes are being addressed by young NCI graduates that are coming right out of your program today or the day after tomorrow. So what we see is a lot of us, let's call it the legacy folks who say, hey, I'm going to focus on banks or credit unions or trusts or, you know, the asset management business. But new folks who are coming in saying, hey, you're missing the role of the hyperscalers. You're missing the growth of China. You're missing the role of the new wave. So I make sure to surround myself with young people. And in fact, for the first time ever in our history, you know, the Middle East and uh, Asia Pacific region has become the largest region in the world for us. It's amazing. And the customers that we work with, Ping An, Tencent, Alibaba, you name it, and financial, different. So let's let's do the classic INSEAD thing. What are you seeing globally? So when you think about how this fintech revolution is playing out, I mean, increasingly technology is fragmenting. How would you care or characterize the similarities and differences between Asia, Europe, the Americas? Yes. So let's start with the similarities and then go to the differences. So the similarity is that the conversation in the boardroom is similar. And the conversation in the boardroom is, one, why is my return on equity below my cost of equity? And it still is in a large number of financial institutions, and it's painful. Two, that takes me to the cost to income ratio. Why do I have a cost to income ratio that's so far north of, of 50? And three, how should I be thinking about growth? Because my relevance is under attack. So should I be thinking about growth differently? Mm. So that's the, those are the similarities. If you go to what's different, Asia first. Asia first, it's extraordinary how much they see around the corner, leapfrog, jump to the role of data, innovate on business models, have a much more open mindset to reach and relevance. So Asia is, is first and foremost, we see the most innovative business models and the fastest moving uh, entities in Asia specifically. I just got to try to interrupt, but is that mostly driven by what you see in, in China or are there other, um, prototypical markets in Asia that you find also so forward-looking? Yeah, so prototypically, you would say greater China, including Hong Kong, Taiwan, yeah. has a very significant culture of entrepreneurship in the area of financial technology, in the intersection of finance and technology. However, large population uh, geographies like Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and uh, Myanmar are also leapfrogging very quickly. It's very interesting. We've always said that banking is ultimately correlated with GDP and population, and GDP and population growth is, you know, two thirds bias to that part of the world. How, how freaked out are, are people in the China ecosystem by the government regulation moves? Obviously, the things we saw with Ant, or even just the moves against Didi um, uh, recently. Do, do you think? Do you, do you sense that's going to change some of the dynamics? Yes and no. So I think the, the yes part of it is entrepreneurs are more aware of keeping the Chinese authorities and regulators on site, right? right? Not becoming too powerful or too brazen in, in, a, in a Chinese mindset uh, perspective. Uh, and no, because the domestic market is so extraordinary, which is, you know, it's, it's, you know, I meet more people in China, so to speak, who are looking at mining the Chinese market who have no interest in inter international geographies. Why would I go Ping An? They're a shareholder in Panastra. Why would I go further when there's so much to be done here? All right, I interrupted. Um, why don't we go back and, and share a little bit what you're seeing then in Europe and, and, and the US, North America? Yeah, so the traditional, somewhat stereotypical differences between North America and Europe. And Peter, you're a North American, I'm a European, so I'm not going to insult anybody here. Oh, no. But uh, you know, the North Americans, uh, particularly the United States, they tend to react very, very quickly. So you saw this in the 2008 financial crisis, they would just rip the plaster off and deal with the problem. The Europeans, we tend to rip the plaster off one hair at a time, right? So it's it's slower, it's more painful, it goes on forever. So the speed of transformation, and you know, it's the, it's the European way sometimes. It's stereotypical, I know, because we have some wonderful entrepreneurial companies, as you mentioned with the co-founders. But nonetheless, in the financial backbone of uh, Europe, 
you, you, you go back to the conversation in the boardroom, look at my return on equity, look at my cost over ratio. Am I even thinking about growth in the right way? Mm -hmm. um, well, last question, actually, uh, Nikita, well, I, I see we do have some questions coming in, so I'll, 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 I'll call, call you in in just a second. But I guess my, my last one is um, when you look more broadly at all the trends hitting business today, so sustainability, the COVID, remote work, um, a lot of these things, are, are there particular other trends that you find particularly relevant for your work in financial services that, that you're watching um, these days? Yes, so I'll pick up on your two threads. So as you rightly say, there's a lot of focus on DEI and CSR and ESG, right? We love acronyms, we love acronyms. But if you said, give me one word, which is the mega trend, I would say that word is purpose. You know, we really, really see people who want to be part of something in the private sector, right? Almost performing the role that you historically used to expect from the public sector. So I see more and more people joining Finastra because they think they can work on the one and a half trillion dollar trade financing gap. They think they can play a role in eliminating cash out of our societies. They think they can bring hundreds of millions of people into financial services for the first time. They believe they can make the world a better place through their work. And uh, purpose, I think, is the uber umbrella which I see out there. I, one, one anecdote, I, I talked to a senior alum who's been recruiting for like an investment bank for like 20 years. And one of his favorite questions was, where does money rank in your, your motivators? And um, again, it doesn't have to be number one, but if it's in the top three, it's, I'm going to have a lot better chance of recruiting this person. But again, he just says year after year for the last five years, on average, it goes down, even in the people applying for investment banking jobs. Yeah. Um, Nikita, so over to um, someone from that generation. Um, do you want to pick a, a couple of the questions from the audience for Simon, please? Yeah, for sure. So I've just been monitoring the questions and a couple of themes that are emerging here and I'll sort of synthesize them into, into two questions. So the first, Simon, being, again, looking at Finastra's core strengths and competencies. So it looks like you're obviously operating in a variety of different sectors of fintech focused on the software and the platform element of things for a variety of them. But how do you, addressing so many of these, compete with those niche players? So if we talk about, for instance, uh, helping those legacy banks with their tech infrastructure, how does a Finastra compete with a Mambu or a Mantle, which is super, super focused on that one area? Can you talk a bit about your, your competitive advantage there? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess if we paraphrase the question, how does, how does a dinosaur compete with a digital native? Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. So let's have a bit of fun with the language. So you, you've got the digital natives out there. So there's two ways we can compete. One is, quite frankly, me too. We have the scale and the financial strength to say, you know what? We don't have to transform from A to B. Like you, we can just begin at B. The beautiful thing about technology and cloud in particular is that it's ubiquitous. It's not owned by anybody, it's available to everybody. So anybody can initiate a new core banking platform, a new payments platform, a new treasury platform, including us, right? So we, we can also jump our, or leapfrog our own frog, right? We can jump ourselves and we do. However, the second, is there are still economies of domain and there are still economies of scale. So we work in very complex areas. So if you're thinking about trading in asset classes, or, you know, whether it be money markets or FIC or synthetic derivatives, this is complex stuff. So the ability to have domain at scale is not easy to achieve. Secondly, we have an incumbent customer base. You know, Peter highlighted it right up front. It takes a very long time to get to 9,000 customers. The first one is relatively easy. The second one and the third one, it starts to teach the, uh, the startups a few things. You have to think about multi-jurisdiction, multi-time zone, multi-currency, multi to the N. You start learning what it is to become a software player at scale. We've already learned that. So yes, we are a dinosaur of sorts, but we are moving and we can, we can emulate and go fast at scale with the domain. Excellent. Um, and then another question towards the, the future of Finastra. So you've addressed a little bit of this already in terms of which markets are, you know, EMEA and, uh, and APAC doing particularly well for, for Finastra. But what are your big bets uh, over the next couple of years? Is it fast growing markets like in Africa, for instance, where we're seeing the, you know, double digit growth of a lot of fintechs in that area? Is it crypto? Is it cross-border transfers and remittances? Can you talk a bit about your, your big priorities and, and bets? Yep. So to know where you're going, sometimes you need to know where you have been. So, you know, if I go back three years ago, and this is something I learned through the INSEAD education, was brutal focus and brutal prioritization. So three years ago, we had more than 100 products. Today, we have just 17. You know, three years ago, we had no customers on the cloud. Today, we have 4,700. 
three years ago, we had software and other stuff. Now it's just software. So we have done so much work over the three years, we are now enabled to go and accelerate into the future. Now, if you said, what is that acceleration? Well, three years ago, it was the future of finance is open. Today, we rephrase that to we intend to orchestrate the future of open finance, right? So we can embrace a whole new business model, which we believe to be a $1 trillion opportunity for our customers and a tripling of the target addressable market for us. And we don't believe anyone else can do that. Awesome. Nikita, thank you. Keep monitoring the questions. We will definitely come back. These are, these are really some great questions coming in. Actually, Simon, I'm going to mix things up a little bit. Why don't we move to leadership now? So exactly what have you, you learned about the kind of transformation of a dinosaur, as you put it, um, to, to, to actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with digital natives? I think, especially post-pandemic, I see so many you know, companies sort of waking up and thinking, oh, this is serious. And, and trying to do the kind of journey that you've done. So talk to us a little bit about how did, it, it sounds so easy, 100, to seven, 100 products to 17. Um, what, what was that journey like and what did you learn along the way? Yeah, so if I take the two strategy teachers who taught me most, number two is Peter. Number one is Aristotle. <laughs> so Aristotle, he wrote a wonderful treatise called The Art of Persuasion. And he said, if you wanna persuade people to move forward, then you need to deploy the tactics of ethos, pathos, and logos. So ethos is you need to start from a point of empathy, the word that ethos derives, and show that you understand their current context. Pathos, which doesn't derive a word, should give us what could be possible, imagine what if. And then logos should give us the logic of how do you go from A to B. Mm -hmm. So I borrowed your teachings and his language. So I said, okay, so I understand where you are. You are on-premise, mainframe, legacy, dinosaur. And I used the word figuratively. Now, what if, what if we could beat the Mambos and the thought machines and the next generation players at their own game? And what if we could do it like this? And then the logic in between. And it's going to require us to rationalize our footprint, modernize our software, move over to the cloud, say no to more transactions, focus only on growth geographies. And that's what we ignited over these last three years. So ethos, pathos, and logos has been a big part of the leadership toolkit. What was your mix in terms of changing the mindset of your existing people and leaders versus also bringing new, new perspectives, new people into the organization? Yeah, no, it, that's, a, that's a shocking realization. So when uh, I declared that the future of finance is open three years ago, two of my leadership team resigned. And that was a leadership test for me because they said, Simon, you are wrong. The industry will never be open. Everything is proprietary. Data is sacred. It cannot be shared. Nobody will integrate third-party components. You are simply wrong. So that was a choice I had to face and they had to face at that time. And it led to their resignation and my renewed conviction. And then what you find is like gravity, it attracts those people who are like-minded until you get to a hmm. tipping point. Now, I would say that the tipping point for the future of finance is open didn't occur, occur in my first year. It occurred in my third year. Hmm. Now, now I think we naturally repel people who have different values and different beliefs. But until then, mm. it was a real transformation of belief. Mm -hmm. And you, you feel uh, interesting. And in the end, though, you're able to attract the people with the energy to, to move forward on this. Yes, everything has changed down to our dress code, our employee value proposition, the way our brand is perceived. We've, everything has changed to reinforce the central big idea. Very good. So, yeah, so the, anyway, what I take away is the key importance of having a clear vision to drive the change. And then there's obviously lots of pieces. What about the other? So clearly you talked some about the, the, the stakeholders um, or the, the employees. As you said, a third of your time up front is spent with uh, capital, with, with, with investors and such. How, how was the journey with them? I assume they were largely bought in at the beginning when they brought you in? Yeah, use the, use the word of clarity. I will add a word, which is consequent clarity. Mm. Or clarity that causes consequence. So the investors and the uh, shareholders wanted to be convinced that migrating a customer from product A to product B was a tolerable level of risk. Moving from our data center to cloud was a tolerable level of risk. Moving into geography A from geography B was a tolerable level of risk. So the consequent clarity was that was an educational process that you know consumed a third of my time. Now that the numbers speak for themselves, I think that proportion of my work will dilute a little bit, but it was, uh, it took a third of the time. 
Mm -hmm. uh, three, I mean, for maybe you could give us just a, for those who don't know, a little taste of the kind of numbers that, that the performance numbers you're starting to generate. But, but also, it, and then the second thing, this is, this is fairly fast for a transformation. I mean, sometimes um, it often takes even, even longer, I think. If you think about situations like GE or something that ran out of runway in many ways. Yes, yes. Although, you know, the nature of a board, and as you said, I sit on two boards so I can enjoy the other side of the table, is what you achieved after three years, you should have achieved three years ago. But that's, uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's the fun of the, the, the job and the, and the, and the role of CEO. So I believe, like you, it has been fast. So to give you some of the numbers, uh, I'll give you revenue metrics, but I'll give you the other metrics that matter as well. So if you take the revenue metrics, we've grown to $1.8 billion of revenue, which makes us the largest software company in the world by software revenues focused on financial services. We've grown our EBITDA to about $760 million or 43%. And our growth solutions are approaching double digit growth, which is you know, an awesome combination to, to have. If you look at kind of the non-financial metrics, you know, the number of females in our leadership have swelled to 37%. And we've publicly committed to 50-50 at every level of the company by 2030. We've declared a net zero ambition. We pay back more into society than we've ever done, including the largest corporate donation we've ever made in our history uh, last year to Feeding America. So there's a lot of goodness. The phrase that we use is doing well by doing good. So why don't we, that's uh, exactly where I wanted to go. Why don't we unpack that a little bit? What, um, in terms of the push around diversity, net zero, um, how did that play as part of the transformation? And I might say, wow, you said focus. That seems like here you're doing, you know, too many things. And is there a way in which they were complementary? Yes, absolutely. So in terms of diversity, and let's, let's focus on gender diversity, but we can go to ethnicity and age as well. Uh, as well as sexual orientation, we can go any, any aspect of diversity or intersectionality as it's often referred to. So on the gender diversity, we made the point very forcefully that we will perform better as a business if we look like the markets we serve, right? So when people say, why do I care about diversity, equity, and inclusion? I give a very honest answer, even though I offend some people, which is self-interest. We will attract more people, we will perform better as a company, it will be a more agreeable workplace, it will be self-reinforcing. Right? So it's self-interest as why we, uh, we push on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. In terms of how we go about CSR as, as the next pillar before we get to ESG, you know, we focus on things which are very close to home. So social inclusion, we bring in a lot of people who are our first college uh, students or sponsorship students for the first time. We focus a lot on financial inclusion and financial education because it will feed more financial services down the line, et cetera. Um, very interesting. Just anything you've learned along the way around actually realizing the, the progress you've made, say on gender diversity or diversity more generally, any tips um, in terms of what to do to actually um, get traction on these things? Yeah, you know, as, as leaders and, and everyone on your call is a leader, you know, what we do and say signals greatly. So everybody watches our behavior, everybody watches what we do, how we invest our time. And to agree, it will be emulated because you're setting an implicit expectation. So lead, leaders go first is the phrase, you know, leaders go first, walk the talk, talk the walk, whichever way you want to call it, leaders go first. All right, um, before we open up for questions, I did want to, I was very interested in when I was catching up on what you've been up to around the global trade piece, uh, Finestra, how does, how does that fit in and what is it like to be pushing global trade in a period of what seems like deglobalization? Yes, fascinating question. So the statistics and then uh, the answer to your question. So the statistics are typically global trade finance has grown at about one and a half to two times the rate of global, global GDP, except for the last 10 years, right? Where, where it's been at equal to or less than the rate of global GDP, which is a paradox because as you said, it's the opposite of the expected result of globalization. Now the consequence of that is tens, if not hundreds of millions of people are trapped into poverty for a long time because trade was one of the mechanisms by which they could uh, create some wealth. Now, somebody said to me, and this was the inspiration, somebody said to me, Simon, if a people or a society or a country need a good or service, need a good or service, either there is trade or there is conflict, right? Mm -hmm. And conflict is bad. It can come in the form of war or it can come in the form, as we've seen in Europe, of mass migration. So if you care about migration that you can manage and if you care about lack of conflict, then trade is good. In fact, the current uh, director general of the World Trade Organization, he came to one of our seminars and said, trade is good, more trade is better, right? And we tend to believe. Now, 
if you think about the needs of the society today, wouldn't it be great if we knew that the palm oil that we were buying did not come from slash and burn farming, but it came from sustainable farming? Wouldn't it be nice to know that the ruby that I'm buying is not a blood ruby, but a sustainably sourced ruby? Wouldn't it be great if the cost of sending a container from Africa for paperwork wasn't $20,000, but was completely digital? Wouldn't it be great? And technology, the intersection of technology, finance, policy, and corporates, the four of us, we can make this better. We can make this better directly. There's a one and a half trillion dollar trade financing gap for SMEs. And I believe that we can, uh, we can address that uh, if we think together. And concretely, again, we're it's, a, it's a complex period, a lot of nationalism and talking about localizing supply chains. Where sort of concrete, when you get the group together, where do they see you know, ways to move forward? Where, where are the places where you can you know, reduce the frictions, um, get, the, get the financing in place? Yeah. So on the topic of supply chain, you're right. There's been phrases around right shoring, near shoring. You know, uh, I think the language that people are gravitating towards now is resiliency, which is reducing a little bit of single dependency, which is probably a smart thing to have been thinking about anyway. So more resilient supply chains. Where people's minds are at is obviously on ensuring that uh, as we promote trade, we don't promote fraud. We don't break sanctions. We don't encourage anti-money laundering. So a lot of this is being focused on identification, knowing your customer, sanction screening, but also more and more is being focused on automation, streamlining, taking out friction, making it seamless and frictionless, particularly in physical, physical supply chains. Um, actually, so we, I haven't pushed you on different technologies. I, I won't do too much, but just as you think about trade, what's your, what's your view on blockchain and, and to what extent does it have a role, an important role to play in terms of improving uh, trade or, or not so much? Yeah, so I think the attributes of blockchain, and as you said, there are different blockchains, you know, there's a joke, which is uh, the beautiful thing about standards is there are so many of them, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so there are a lot of hammers looking for a nail with blockchain, yeah. there are blockchain hammers. It seems to be gravitating towards a nail, which is the benefit of blockchain is that it's immutable. So for areas like smart contracts to make the contract immutable, that obviously is very powerful. If we can apply that immutability to topics like identity, then that's very powerful also. So there is a role for blockchain capabilities. Very good. Um, Nikita, I should have given you a heads up, but why don't, um, why don't you come back in? And uh, again, if you've got more stuff on the leadership side, on, on the trade side, that's great. And, or you can take us back to FinTech, wherever the audience wants to go. Cool. Okay. Um, so firstly, thanks to the audience for some great questions here. And I'll try to try bring as many of those uh, together. But let's take a step back um, to, to going back to the, the operating model and the business itself. Um, so one um, question, Simon, your customer acquisition strategy and your focus, we kind of discussed this a little bit before but when you and I spoke, but Enterprise versus the startups and the small to medium enterprises. Um, what's the focus? How is that governing customer acquisition strategy as you expand? Yeah, so we are very uh, systematic by what we call a net new name customer. So a net new name customer for us is somebody who's never used any of our products at any time in the last three years. So typically, historically, we've not seen many net new names because they're, you, you know we have 90 of the top 100 banks or you know, 4,500 with the top 5,000, et cetera. So not, not many net new names until we start to think differently. When we start thinking about how many customers we don't have in sub-Saharan Africa, or how many customers we don't have in Southeast Asia or in Latin America. So you move the lens from, hey, look what I've got and how can I grow it to look at the, the farmland in the wild west that we can still go and explore. And that's why I keep reminding the team that banking is ultimately, ultimately correlated with GDP and population. Today, that's a Western Northern Hemisphere uh, construct, but tomorrow it's not. So we need to send the, you know, sow the seeds of tomorrow's acorn trees, oak trees tomorrow, you know, now. And, and taking off of that, uh, with the growth itself uh, for Vernastro, both in terms of product and customer base, um, will you be focused largely on organic growth or are you looking towards acquisitions, m as well? I know you've made a couple of acquisitions in two, uh, Alpha Trade and Malaysia, I think, in the, in the last uh, recent times. Are you looking to, to go on an acquisition spree? Is that how you look to expand as well? Yeah. So we will look to do both. Organic, organic growth is the most important because unless you are organically growing in the growing market, you are by definition dying, mm -hmm. right? So either you're organically growing or you are dying. So organic growth is what I care about first and foremost. However, we mentioned our revenues, 1.8 billion. We believe the TAM to be in the region of 50 billion. 
So another way of saying it is as a joke is we are so large, we're almost invisible, right? There's $48 billion, which is not in our pockets, right? And the market is so fragmented. So the opportunity for consolidation, knowing that we have global distribution, global support, global backbone as a platform of uh, systems, you know, we can, we can consolidate the industry rapidly. And it's something that I would very much like to do. We do care about the integration, culture, fit, et cetera, but we'll be playing on both levers, organic and inorganic, absolutely. And on that, uh, the, the cultural and organizational side of things, uh, taking it back to, to OV class a little bit, um, the operating model itself of, of Finastra, as you've expanded over the years, geographies, different types of skill sets, how has that had to pivot? Uh, I've, I've worked in SaaS and FinTech myself and seen those models really have to, to move around to accommodate to new sources of revenue. Um, so tell me a bit about that. Yeah, so I'll give you two answers. One is contextual to where you are at a point in time. And the other is just how simple it can be if you think about it. So contextual, when we merged two companies on June the 13th, 2017 to make Panastra, the owners at the time said, Simon, one company has a functional model and the other company has a line of business model. One of you is gonna to have to change. What are you gonna do? And I said, well, if then, I said, if what you care about most is capturing the synergy, then let's go to a functional model because I can guarantee through a single throat to choke, we get the synergies. If you care most about a single operating model, then go to a functional model because I can make sure services, sales, finance, HR run exactly the same way. If you care most about the customer experience, then move to a line of business model because then you have a single executive who owns the entire experience. So for the first three years of our existence, we had a functional model. For the next three years of our existence, I suspect we're going to move because we've done the hard work towards delighting the customer. So that's mm -hmm. answer one. Answer two is, you know, when you boil it all down, it boils down to cost to make, cost to sell, cost to serve. And we've now designed our organization around just those three pillars, making the products and solutions, selling them, serving them, and then doing it in an infinity loop. Every moment of truth is uh, an infinity loop. Actually, I'm going to just interject on that. So you, you said spend about a third of your time understanding where the customers are going and delighting those customers will be the future. Um, what have you learned? What do you tricks do you have for you trying, on the one hand, yourself keep the pulse on on what your customers need, but also then building an organization that really has that customer focus and really deeply is moving to to just improve the customer experience. Yep. So two things I think. One is, um, and again, I learned these things in your classes and other classes. One is active listening. If you just take the time, the customer will unpack for you a great deal about what their problem is, where their pain point is, where they're stuck on their journey, what's the nature of their frustration. So active listening is a huge part of what we do. And it goes also to feed the ethos, pathos, logos. But I'm also reminded of one of your classes about Steve Jobs, where he made the famous quote, which is, hey, I've never been sufficiently stupid to ask a customer what they want. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right? How, how would they know that they want a thousand songs in their pocket? They wouldn't know that. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't know it was possible, right? So there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting balance about what do you bring as an innovator versus mm -hmm. what did you hear as a business person? Cool. Thank you. Uh, Nikita, back to you. Yeah, um, super interesting. Uh, and, and I appreciate the quotes that you've, uh, you've peppered uh, this conversation with today, Simon. Definitely jotted a couple of them down. Um, I have a question that came from a couple of members of the audience on um, financial inclusion. Uh, and this is mm. specifically right. with respect to micro businesses. Um, so obviously we know that you have some of the largest financial institutions as your clients, but what about those micro businesses in the Sub-Saharan Africa's and Latin America's of the world um, who are increasingly becoming digitally empowered? Is Finastra looking to offer specific solutions to them, different business model maybe in terms of acquiring those customers? Um, would love to hear what you think that. Yeah, it's a good question. So your first point about serving the larger customers, actually what we have to do is to look through our customers at their customers. Mm -hmm. And that's something we have to remind ourselves every day, which is, hey, you may be bank ABC and very large, but let's remind ourselves of who you serve and who you will be serving. So you need to look through customers to their customers. Mm -hmm. But it goes back to the three big questions, return on equity, cost of income, am I thinking about growth the right way? So many of them are realizing that SMEs whether you love them or hate them, are the backbone of the planet. They're the backbone of employment, they're the backbone of economy, they're the backbone of trade, and they are a massive, unfulfilled, but be increasingly sophisticated customer group. So an SME in sub-Saharan Africa will require treasury services. 
they will require foreign exchange services, they will require lending, they will require cost-effective payments, and they will require it digitally, not via a branch. So I think people are waking up to, hey, let's look through the customer at their customer, and let's look at the massive unpenetrated uh, or unsufficiently penetrated area of SMEs. Cool. Um, let, me, let me build on that a little bit. One of the things that's opening up um, services to smaller players, the unserved, is you know, massive automation through data, machine learning, AI. Um, curious a little bit what your view is on, on how much legs the sort of data AI has to run in the industry. And also, what are you doing about it? How, where, where do you think about um, how much data science capability do you build? Where, how do you think about that part of your strategy? Yeah, so data, people say that data is the new oil, okay? Mm -hmm. we, we will say we disagree. When you consume oil, it's gone. When you consume okay. data, you create more data, right? Which, mm. is, which is a very interesting thing. So data about data about data is very interesting. So the ability to convince people to share data that's obfuscated, sanitized, anonymized, call it what you will, but to pay them back with relevance, that's the phrase. People will exchange data for relevance, right? So that's part of our job. So for example, we have okay. one and a half thousand customers who run one of our applications called MortgageBot. It runs mortgages in the United States. We've said to them, because you're all on cloud, you're all on the same version, if you give us what's called RTU, or the right to use the data, we will pay you back showing how you perform against your peer group, against all of these attributes. And we'll even, through artificial intelligence, tell you how we think you can improve. Not against your competitor against across mm -hmm. the street, but the competitor in the next state. So everyone is willing to share. Now, the Western mindset is very different to the Chinese mm -hmm. mindset. The Chinese mindset is I can exploit data to a far greater degree than we can do with our privacy restrictions in Europe or the United States, for example. So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a different playing field emerging, which is going to be interesting for the regulators, but also interesting for the consumers. Uh, I just want to under, I mean, I, one of the fascinating things about this revolution is the value comes from integrating the data. And again, in industries like healthcare, like financial services, the culture has always been protect. And so again, I, I really see if players can get people to change their thinking, there's a lot of value you can unlock. Yes, and that's where banking is privileged because uh, they know everything about you and the journey that you're on. So Peter, you made a joke as I made a joke about our children going to college, right? Your banks know this. So mm -hmm. if you know just a little bit of the data at the top of the iceberg, you can infer a great deal. Peter, do you need help with their insurance? Do you need help with their travel? Do you need help with their funding? Do you need help with an allowance, with a card, you can infer a great deal. You can infer a great deal. And what you give as an answer will create more data, right? Uh, so uh, yes, it, it, it's, it's a skill to be learned and it's actually going relatively slowly in financial <laughs> services. It's going relatively slowly. It, it, it's an interesting one. Uh, Nikita, yeah. over to you. Yeah, that's, that's a great segue into one of the questions I had. So open finance, open banking, we're really fortunate to be at a, at a great time in terms of regulation where you have the plaids of the world, the tinks of the world, allowing us to connect to these APIs and develop all sorts of new products. Um, but how conscious and, and, and sensitive are you to the fact that changes in regulation come up all the time? Uh, and so when you're designing products, leveraging a lot of this data where that's the critical portion, how do you design them keeping in mind that regulations could change? and you maybe snatch control of this data, so on and so forth. Yeah, so I'll give you two answers. One is as a businessman, and the other is a member of society. So mm -hmm. as a businessman, regulation is the gift that keeps on giving, mm -hmm. right? Because banks have no choice but to be compliant, and that means the software must be continuously updated. <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, will, I will make sure we're regularly compliant everywhere in the world we work, right? And customers will keep buying more software as a result of it. Even if it's yeah. just the update, it's the gift that keeps on giving. So I have no issues with regulation. <laughs> As a member of society, I try and remind myself, why do I want regulation? Is it to control or is it to stimulate? The answer, of course, is both. But one thing that regulation does effectively and increasingly more so is stimulate competition. Now, some of that competition may kill me, but if they pay me 30% why they kill me, it's okay, which is a platform economics mindset, mm -hmm. right? So again, I welcome it. If it's stimulating competition, Wonderful. Bring it on. Nice. Nikita, do you have like a couple last questions and then we'll, we'll start to wrap this up? 
Yeah, I've got one recurring theme here on um, data privacy. Um, so as your product being developed and you have access to all this critical data, um, how are you thinking about cybersecurity and, and data privacy at Finestra? Yeah, so trust is the ultimate currency. So one thing I didn't say on Peter's question earlier about AI, and artificial intelligence, machine learning, is we spend a lot of time trying to remove bias from AI. So as you know, there is no bias in mathematics, but there is bias in the author of code. So we try and take a lot of time. In fact, we require uh, people who partner with us on our platform to certify that they were removing bias from AI. I think that's going to be very important. Um, as to your question, as we take privacy, trust is the ultimate currency. So again, we do a lot of things internally to make sure that we're you know, fighting against the cybersecurity threat, which will only increase every day of our lives, right? Because it's such rich potential rewards. However, we also partner with industry leaders to make sure that we're doing this collectively. So if Microsoft, for example, can spend a billion dollars a year on security, that's a billion more than I can do, right? So working with them and leveraging cloud scale and cloud economics helps us all. Excellent. And on that on that note, um, in terms of the diversity of hires uh, at, at Finastra, especially as it relates to data and artificial intelligence, where you're kind of almost, uh, you're almost dictating the way that these machines think, these models behave and, and, and affecting a lot of uh, activity going there. Do you find that in AI and data, especially at Finastra, you're hiring more diverse people of diverse backgrounds, both academically to affect the way in which they think and, and think about the ethics of AI, whether they're literature grads or physics grads, you've seen that that adds value to Finastra? Is that, is that something that you're, you're looking at? It is. Diversity of thought and perspective enriches the discussion, no doubt about it. My former boss said to me, give me a music student, I will give you back a coder. <laughs> right and, then, and there's a lot of logic to why he would say that yes. but, the, but the but the signal is you know be more broad in terms of the skill sets that you're bringing to bear so it's diversity as you rightly said Nikita in, in all of its attributes in all of its attributes it, it creates much more holistic thinking so Nikita thank you so much for channeling the audience questions as usual excellent job um so I mean, I'm just going to wrap up with a few last um reflective questions first of all What's your advice for people like Nikita, other um, current MBAs or young alums really interested in the sector of financial services? Um, what kind of advice would you have for them about how to develop themselves and their careers, what to think about in terms of what jobs to take? You know, uh, I, I was once a student asking that same question to a former INSEAD alum who came to speak to us, and he was in a similar age group to me uh, then. <laughs> And he gave some advice. He said, you know what? Get to what you love doing as fast as possible. Mm. Get to what you love doing as fast as possible. And, and I would echo, echo that. There's nothing, there's nothing like living a fulfilled life and enjoying what you do. And, and, you know, and many of you know that the word passion comes from the meaning of the word passion is suffering for your love. Right? <laughs> so don't expect it to be just enjoyment, but you will suffer for your love. And that's the meaning of the word passion. The second, which makes more sense to Europeans than Americans who embrace it much more openly, is it's okay to fail, mm -hmm. right? I remember what my OB teacher at INSEAD said, uh, do you girls and, and boys understand the difference between understanding and learning? And we all sat there kind of pretending that we did. And then she yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> and then we got it, then we got it. Learning is that which changes a, you know, causes a change in your behavior. And that comes from failing, that comes from experimenting, that comes from you know, hitting the ground and learning by, by doing. So I would just pay those two things forward as they were paid to me. Get to what you love doing as fast as you can, embrace failure and celebrate it. All right, Simon, thank you. Um, one other, just, just on the strategy, I, I can't help but ask, but uh, around partnering, I mean, you mentioned working with Microsoft and clearly part of being agile and adapting fast is being very strategic about who you work with in these digital economies. Um, who are some of the, yeah, how do you approach that? Um, even some of the, the companies that you're really enjoying the partnership with these days. Yeah, absolutely. So internally, I try and avoid the word partnering. I change it for ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is to remind everybody that if you think about a coral reef, we cannot survive without one another. Mm -hmm. It's not because I temporarily need you. The coral reef needs the sharks, needs the fish, needs the coral. They, everything needs to be there. Otherwise, it won't work. The symbiosis won't happen. It's the same for us in our business. We cannot succeed without the partners that we refer to as our ecosystem. So Microsoft, people think Microsoft is a cloud engine for us. It's not. We embed our software into Microsoft Dynamics. You go into the Microsoft Technology Center in New York, you launch payments from behind Dynamics. We develop our power apps on their capability. We have a data share agreement under NDA. 
you do a huge amount of things together without knowing who in the room is from which company. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you for hearing that. Okay, to wrap up, um, uh, just final thoughts. You've got you know uh, lots of talent listening to you. So any particular calls to action for the group? Also, a little bit. You know, what are the kind of things that you know make you excited about where business and society is going? But also some of the the things that you know as privileged leaders we should really be worried about um, and and step up on. Any any closing thoughts for us? Yeah, I'll pick up on your word of privilege. I, I think um, we, the people on this call, are uniquely privileged at a point in time to play a role in both private and public sector, but in particular in private sector, to help society evolve. I think, you know, over the last 100 years, we abdicated that out to public sector. I've never seen public sector more fractious, more burdened, more debt loaded. So I think the opportunity of public sector to rise to the occasion to help drive a better society and better outcomes for the planet and the people. I think it's, it's on us and it's a position I would describe of unique privilege. It falls to us and why not? We can have fun doing it and we can do it faster. All right. Thank you, Simon, so much for coming back to INSEAD. Um, great, great to have you. Great to reconnect with you after, after these years. And um, yeah, stay in touch and, and keep just having that, that amazing impact and passion for what you do. We hope you don't suffer it. too much. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Keep the passion, but know it's suffering. Nikita, Nikita, Pascal, thank, you, thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Cheers. Cheers.